Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The state of Texas dealing with a drug abuse failure. It's now in line for a $2 million makeover for curing the crisis. It's a big federal grant that will expand how we go forward with an opioid crisis that continues to take lives, particularly in rural Texas. And as we speak, UT Health San Antonio's Be Well effort is creating a new plan of attack for the problem that is being forced to include new drugs, killing families and ruining home lives at an increasing rate. If you live in the big city, you likely know less about this, but head over to rural Texas and opioid-related overdoses, not just in your face, but hard to treat. You're looking at heroin. Heroin and heroin being used intravenously or IV use. And then there's, of course, the synthetic opioids. Those are the prescription drugs that nowadays are being laced with fentanyl, a way for the addicted to get a greater high and at the same time, a greater chance of overdose. Then you have those individuals that, that have no idea that what they just purchased and is laced with fentanyl, which unfortunately can lead to a death. And so goes the problem that up until now has largely been unaddressed in the most remote counties of Texas due to a lack of access to care making these the worst hotspots, but with the most stigma attached to getting help for those addicted. For example, while a city like San Antonio has about a 29% rate of opioid pill distribution, a rural county like Young County in North Texas has an 88% distribution rate, almost three times ours. We can help them set up the substance use treatment services, give them the resources, but more than anything else, give them that education and training that they need to understand these disorders. Now, UT Health San Antonio is going to take control using those federal dollars to train, educate, and ultimately begin treatment within reach for those who are addicted. They're going to take away the barriers that currently exist, like lack of transportation, doctors, and rehab in 179 rural areas that currently have little or no substance abuse treatment. And finally, they're going to use telemedicine in a major way for the first time for this, reaching out to those who need help but can't find it in their neighborhoods. After about seven hours of video shown, a former Border Patrol Intel supervisor is heard in great detail confessing to the murder of four sex workers in Webb County back in 2018. The Juan David Ortiz trial is finishing its first week, and the interrogation video came to an end today. Eric Hernandez has more on what Ortiz said, but we do want to warn you about the graphic nature of the testimony. I'm telling you to walk away, but you're not listening to me. Takes a few steps. That was Juan David Ortiz explaining the deaths of Giselda Cantu and Janelle Ortiz. Just moments before Ortiz talked about how he took Melissa Ramirez out to North Webb County and shot her twice, and then 10 days later killed Claudine Luera on September 13, 2018. This almost nine hour interrogation video has been shown to the jury the last few days, but this morning that confession finally being heard. After telling investigators his story, he said while he was waiting to be arrested in the bed of a pickup truck, he called his wife, who was here in San Antonio, visiting family at the time. Ortiz would be booked in charge with the murders of the four women and has been in the Webb County Jail until this year when he was moved to Bear County Jail for his trial. A lot of what was heard this morning was very hard for those victims' families as Ortiz was describing in detail what happened to each woman. Now, this trial isn't over yet. We'll be back here on Monday morning where testimony is expected to continue. At the Kennedy Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Holiday heartbreak for a local woman who lost three children in a Thanksgiving Day shooting last year. Katrina Weber reports even as this mother still suffers from her own bullet wounds, why her deep emotional pain from the unsolved murders is what hurts most now. When the weather change, I can feel it. Mm -hmm. And when I try to stand up on it, sometimes my knee be just weird. 
gunfire that tore into Ishan Wolford's leg last year has left her in almost constant physical pain. Still, it pales in comparison to the emotional pain it caused, the loss of three of her children. These holidays are going to be rough, really rough. It was on a holiday, Thanksgiving of last year, when it happened. The family was celebrating at a home in the 4,000 block of Sunrise Creek when someone in a white car sprayed it with bullets. One thing I heard was, pop, 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 it stopped. Then I guess they clicked it again. Then it started again. She remembers shielding as many of her 12 grandchildren as she could. But when it was over, her sons, 28-year-old Charles Wolford and 25-year-old Eugene Hodge, had been killed. Her daughter, 32-year-old Shinobi Wolford, was paralyzed, then died in June. Ishan tries to remember the good thoughts of them, how Charles could bring a smile to her face. And Shinobi will fix your hair just in a heartbeat. Jean, I call him like me, he's a knee freak. What she can't understand, though, is why someone took all of them away from her. She also wants to know who that someone is. So far, San Antonio police have not made any arrests. Right now, it seems all police have is that very vague description of the car involved, that white four-door car. They urge anyone with information to call Crime Stoppers. The number 210-224-STOP or 224-7867. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Burned remnants, untouched fuel pumps, and lots of questions. That's all that remains of the Flying J and Denny's off of I-10 and Foster Road today. That fire sparked this Thursday morning, tearing through the building. Fortunately, everybody made it out safely. The San Antonio Fire Department says they will not be able to investigate because the building had to be knocked down during the firefighting and cleanup process. And they don't know the exact cause. A spokesperson says the first crews reported it appeared to have started in a griddle vent hood in the Denny's kitchen. More than six months after that deadly shooting at Rob Elementary in Uvalde, the community there has been drastically changed forever. 21 people, 19 students, and two teachers were killed, but not all fourth graders who were shot that day died. We're there uh, we're talking to our family, you know, and everything, and then we get a call from was it the nurse. Mm -hmm. The nurse called and she said, this is so-and-so, I'm the head surgical nurse here, and we're here with Noah, and uh, um, this could take a little bit longer because it's not a flesh wound. He suffered a gunshot wound in the lower back and it exited through his shoulder. So then we're like, okay, so, you know, and I, we I mean- We were under the impression, you know, that it was just a, fle a flesh wound, which we thought, I mean, you know, something And because of the small. way he was when I got to see him, I mean, he, I couldn't see anything but just bandages, so I thought, well, okay, I mean, flesh wound. The first time I saw his, his wounds, um, I just broke down. I couldn't take it. I was like, you know, my baby, you know, what, what did he endure? And then, you know, how did he endure for so long? You know, that was one of the things that you know, we just ask ourselves, what was he doing? You know, how was he doing it? We invite you to watch 21 Taken, Uvalde's Path to Healing. It starts at 7 right here on KSAT. It'll also be streaming on YouTube and KSAT Plus all at that same time. We want to take you outside. Your traffic authority camera is showing us a tough area. This is Highway 90 at Couples. And what you're looking at is there is an accident there. You can see emergency vehicles, one, two, maybe three cars in that area. But they're blocking off that uh, right hand, rather that left hand lane. Uh, you're going to have to get around that. So just a lot of traffic and the roads, of course, a little bit slick it's from to all see the mess. How many lights there actually are there starting to blur together, but definitely be careful on the roadways. New at six, inflation and supply shortages. Some of the areas we and so many organizations and businesses have had to learn to deal with. Habitat for Humanity is one of them. Jonathan Cotto spoke with the vice president of the nonprofit who is celebrating the finishing of their last home of the year, but also recounting how hard the last 12 months have been. So house cost alone, uh, the, the, the cost of materials, all of that has gone up from the beginning of the pandemic until now. Stephanie Wee says at the beginning of 2020, the cost to build a home was roughly $95,000. 
But now they are costing us um, more than one hundred and twenty thousand dollars now a house to build. Habitat for Humanity learning to navigate through the high costs and supply shortages. We're starting to get at the end of the wave in terms of some of the costs being super absorb exorbitant. But it's been it's been truly uh, very hard to get building materials up until now. In Bear County this year, Habitat for Humanity was able to finish 53 Habitat homes. I think what mostly a lot of these costs have done is is prevented us from growing more. Uh, we have so much need in San Antonio and we really wanted to be able to grow more. There are over 100,000 families in San Antonio that are in need of affordable housing and that's where Habitat for Humanity comes into play and despite any challenges that they've been facing this year, construction will continue. They are looking to build at least 250 houses just in this new development alone. So we're trying to increase and we want to stay on that track, uh, but really what has helped us has been the generosity of the San Antonio community. Everyone coming to together, $10 checks, $100,000 checks. It all makes a difference. It all helps our families uh, be able to afford a, a nice, decent, stable home. If you or anyone you know is interested in contributing monetarily or volunteering, you can visit our website, ksat.com, for more information. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. All right, taking a look at live cam. Still lots of cars on the road. Uh, stark difference than what we saw in 1604 at 5 o'clock. It is, but it's also murky out there. Yeah, the drizzle's starting to develop again. The uh, clouds and drizzle starting to reform. Visibility is starting to fall off, and I think it's going to be a pretty quick process here uh, just over the next hour or two. Hey, six hundredths of an inch of rain, better than nothing from all that drizzle earlier today. 65 our high temperature after a low of 50. And temperatures right now, for the most part, in the 60s. No big difference out there. 61 Bernie, 64 Stinson Airport, Pleasanton 65, and New Braunfels 66. Turning damp very quickly this evening. Driv drizzle and fog overnight all the way through tomorrow morning. Temperatures holding steady where they are the rest of this evening. We'll talk about the weekend cool front and how it's going to affect how it feels out there in just a bit. Tonight on the night beat a Thanksgiving holiday ending in death when a woman was shot. Now the family of Joanna Baker is sitting down tonight to speak with KSET just days after an arrest in the case. And just a day after a former SAPD officer was indicted in the shooting of Eric Cantu, his girlfriend is now listed as being represented by the Cantu's attorney. That story and much more tonight on the Nightbeat. UTSA's chance at another conference championship is coming up, but the party's actually been going on for hours and hours. The work week might have kept the crowd down a bit, but those at the tailgate are making up for it. They made up for it all afternoon. Lots to eat and drink, plenty of games on screens and in parking lots. The party goes on at the Alamo Dome. And even with their team gunning for back-to-back -back championships, don't ask these guys to choose which is better, the game or the tailgate. That's question. that's tough. I mean, <laughs> when the tailgate's so good, it's hard to. Yeah, it's, yeah. Because yeah. because uh, uh, our our saying is our slogan. Uh, our, our slogan is we pregame harder than you tailgate. So that's pretty good. On the off chance that you are headed to the game and still have not left yet, there is free parking in city-owned facilities until two in the morning. Uh, but the parking at the Alamo Dome is not free. I like the pun in uh, Garrett's story. The guy said the early birds were yes. out there having a good time. Right. I'm sure the after party will be just as good, if not better, if they can win this game. Oh, absolutely. I think there's going to be a good after party no matter what, to be honest with you. <laughs> Most likely. We just got to figure out where it's at. Exactly. Somebody's going to still... Uh find the after party or get one going. Uh, Weather-wise, it's going to be damp out there this evening. So folks that are in the Alamo Dome right now, once they emerge, they're going to notice the drizzly dampness all over the place again. That's going to be the case tonight through tomorrow morning. Then a weak cold front arrives and gets rid of the drizzle, but we could still see a few sprinkles. And anyway, overall, a very cloudy weekend and some changes to talk about. So let's get right to it, help you prepare for the weekend. Starting with this evening, Visibility down to five miles. We're starting to see that fog and drizzle set in, and I do think it's going to be a really rapid process here over the next hour or two, becoming drizzly, damp, and foggy quickly with those visibilities dropping fast. You look at the visibility now, Gonzales under two miles, already seen some fog there. Starting to see it drop west side of town and south side as well. 
But this is one of those situations where we're all pretty much going to be seeing the fog and drizzle. Here's our feature cast just for visibility and notice by nine o'clock. It's got us under four miles, even three miles visibility here in San Antonio. Bernie under a mile visibility overnight tonight as the fog and drizzle really sets in and gets established. Visibility is under a mile can be expected. So if you do have any travel plans or you'll be out and about tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, get ready for the dampness and the low visibility. This is 715 tomorrow morning, you know, close to sunrise and still we've got that uh, reduced visibility. It's not until 10 11 AM when we get rid of the drizzle. That's when that weak cold front's going to move in. Let's talk about temperatures in that cold front right now. We're in the low 60s and we're not going to see our temperatures change much the rest of the night. Pretty much holding steady all night and even on into tomorrow. The cold front that's headed our way, it's off to the north right now. It's about to hit Wichita, Kansas. Behind it, 20s, teens, and even some single digits. The core of the cold air, Bismarck, North Dakota. Four degrees right now. Even Denver, 32, but Dalhart, Oklahoma at 63. So clearly a big contrast of temperatures along that front. However, for us, we're just going to get clipped by it. It's going to be a very shallow cold front. So it's not going to be a hard hitting front. We're going to be low 60s tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Maybe dip to about 59 at noon and then be around 60 degrees for tomorrow afternoon. So steady temperatures tonight and basically through the day tomorrow. Temperatures won't be affected very much by this front next week. More consistency and warmer will be well into the 70s, but this weekend afternoon temperatures right near 60 degrees, both Saturday and Sunday, so cooler than average. And then we go above average as we get into next week. And one reason for that consistency, let's get to it. There's the cold front to the north, some snow on the back side of it, but no real showers or storms along that front. So it's going to be a dry frontal passage for us, just still cloudy. Uh, all weekend long. Big blue H over the Gulf of Mexico. This is close enough where it's really going to influence our weather over the next seven days and keep any major or big disturbances away from us. In turn, I think just a few sprinkles with this drizzle tomorrow and then maybe a few sprinkles on Sunday. Otherwise, next week we are looking dry, but we'll have the morning fog again. Dew points in the low 60s. You feel the humidity out there. This is going to change because of the cold front. I think the main thing you'll notice with the front tomorrow, dew points dropping off. Notice by 8 a.m. still humid because the cold front hasn't arrived yet. But by the noon hour, our dew points drop down into the 40s. So it's going to feel a little more refreshing outside and less muggy for the afternoon. Cloudy throughout the day, damp for the first part of the day tomorrow. Evening plans on Saturday, holiday parties, just fine. Nothing to worry about. I mean, right near 60 and dropping down into the 50s then and a cloudy sky. North wind at 10 to 15, Sunday morning 51 by the afternoon. We're still near 60, cloudy and a few sprinkles, but not too humid. The humidity's back on Monday every day next week. Morning, fog, drizzle and dampness, but no real appreciable rain. Not great looking, but at least we don't have to change what we're wearing every, <laughs> every single hour. Day. Yeah, every every hour. Here, humidity's yeah. back and we're already in December, but I know. appreciate that, Adam. All right, now the Roadrunners are looking to go back to back in the conference championship, and we're just a few minutes away from kickoff. We are a few minutes away, and their regular season meeting between UTSA and UNT went down to the wire, a four point victory for the Roadrunners, and they won that game in the final 15 seconds. So we are getting ready for UNT UTSA part two. It's coming up in a minute. Plus, USA got some good news today. Christian Pulisic, well, he's good to go. Coming up. You know, we can't go out there Friday like we came out last week or it's not going well for us. Roadrunners quarterback Frank Harris knows they can't afford a slow offensive start tonight against UNT on championship game day. It's almost time for UTSA football to protect its Conference USA Championship. The team looks a little different compared to last season, but the goal remains the same for the Roadrunners beat North Texas. One year ago tomorrow on December 3rd, 2021, UTSA beat Western Kentucky 49-41 to win the Ryan Conference USA Championship game for the first time in program history. Former UTSA running back Sincere McCormick was named game MVP after rushing for 204 yards and three touchdowns. And former UTSA safety Jamal Sam intercepted a pass as time expired to seal the deal. Earlier this week, Frank Harris was asked, does he prefer facing a known rivalry opponent in a championship game, or would it be easier to face a team they have less history with? 
Well, it's not really a difference. I mean, whoever is uh, going to be in the championship game, you know, we're ready to play. It just so happens it's North Texas, so we played them already. Got to learn from the film um, from when we played them and just grow from that. Here's the Ryan Conference USA Championship matchup. Kickoff is in a matter of minutes at 6.30 at the Dome. Earlier today, Incarnate Word head football coach G.J. Kinney was named the new head football coach of Texas State football, the 21st head coach in program history. Kinney will take over the Bobcats after constructing a conference champion, a top 10 nationally ranked team, and FCS playoff participant at UIW. Coach Kinney will lead, continue to lead the Cardinals in the FCS playoffs. UIW will host Furman tomorrow, 1 p.m. at Gale in Tom Benson Stadium. In the NBA, looking for a dub. The Spurs will host the Pelicans tonight in the second matchup between the two Southwest foes. New Orleans won the first meeting in late November, 129 to 110, which is a part of the Spurs' current nine-game losing streak. It's been three weeks since they last tasted a victory. Wednesday night, the Spurs surrendered a 20-point lead at OKC. He had a tough defeat for the Silver and Black. We knew that, you know, we should have won that game. Uh, you know, we let up in the second half. We weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing. We weren't doing what got us the lead, and, you know, the game can, can flip quickly uh, here. Um, it's a long game, and, you know, we got to stay locked in all 48. So we were definitely, definitely disappointed, but we knew that it would be a quick turnaround, and we just got to get ready for tonight. Spurs and Pelicans will play tonight at 7. Yaka Pirtle, Jeremy Sohan, Blake Wesley, uh, Doug McDermott, and Josh Richardson are all out for the Spurs. Brandon Ingram is out for New Orleans, and C.J. McCollum is listed as probable. And here's a video of the U.S. men's national soccer team training Friday in Qatar. And the good news is Christian Pulisic was cleared to play in the round of 16 matchup against the Netherlands tomorrow morning at 9 local time. He's been dealing with a pelvic contusion he got as he scored the only goal of the game Tuesday in a 1-0 win versus Iran. Yesterday, he said the team spirit is great heading into the knockout round. I'm really happy with uh, just the team spirit, uh, what this team has shown, the way we fought through, you know, all the challenges that we've seen. And uh, obviously to get out of the group um, is an unbelievable accomplishment. No word yet if USA striker Josh Sargent, who injured his ankle against Iran, will face the Netherlands. Definitely glad to have him back on the field. We're going to need him. Yep. And the announcer, when he scored that goal, had a great call. He said, Captain America. Captain ah, America, yeah, like that, that was cool. Yep. That was great. Thanks for that, Larry. Yep. After a judgment against him of more than a billion dollars, InfoWars founder Alex Jones has now filed for personal bankruptcy protection. How much money he says he has and how much he says he still owes, that's still to come. And police in Houston making an arrest in the murder of rapper Takeoff, who they say has been charged with a deadly shooting a month ago. Next.